Greetings and welcome to In-Depth from DK Rostar. The Institute for Gender and Development Studies, or IGDS, hosts a virtual presentation titled, Do Women Still Need Rights? It takes place on Wednesday, March 27. Now, before that, though, lecturer and head at the IGDS, Dr. Sue Ann Barrett, she joins us with guest speaker for the presentation on Wednesday, Professor Emerita Rhoda Redock. We plan to discuss the event, other work of the Institute, and issues further afield. Thank you so much for joining us, ladies. I want to start with you, please, Dr. Barrett, in terms of give us an idea of some of the recent work of IGDS. Of course. Thank you, DK. So the IGDS, as you may be aware, is an institute that focuses on gender justice and development, as well as rooting this in a strong feminist scholarship and uh, consistent and sustained advocacy and activism. So our work crosses these uh, sectors, research and publication, advocacy, movement building, and of course, outreach. Some of these areas that preoccupy us at present and have preoccupied us for, for some time are those vulnerabilities around climate, and social change, gender-based violence, uh, economic justice, especially in terms of gender-responsive budgeting, financing measures for women uh, to alleviate poverty, and so much more. We also focus on issues of identity, representation, and these are intersecting identities, social identities, gender, race, class, religion, masculinity is another core area of research. Of course, climate change isn't the only um, uh, focus. It's, top, it's popular now, but we have always looked at agroecology and matters of the environment. We explore, of course, women and girls, their sexual and reproductive rights, comprehensive sexuality education, and so much more around that part of uh, how humans relate in the social relations of gender. I must say that we do attend very much to issues of family violence, issues of movement building, legislative change. So there's a range of things that continue to preoccupy us. We have inherited them. And we also attend to emerging vulnerabilities that intersect with gender justice, gender development, and again, understanding gendered realities in the region. And hopefully we can speak to some of those emerging vulnerabilities in just a bit, but uh, Professor, are you nodding your head? Uh, so mm -hmm. how does that tie into some of the history of the IGDS and its philosophical underpinnings? Well, I was nodding my head because I was saying, you know, things are continuing, our traditions are holding strong, you know, strong scholarship, strong research, but also strong outreach and interface with the community, movement building and activism. That has been the hallmarks of the IGDS, a sense of gender justice and broader social justice. So I'm really pleased to hear uh, Sue Ann highlight these again. And looking, and Dr. Barrett, <laughs> the distinction of approaching issues from a gender nuance perspective or position, that really considers the role that gender and development might play in a situation. How does that make some of these conversations change a little bit, or does it alter them? You know, DK, it gives us an expansive view. It gives us that tense view from below and above as well. And what do I mean by that? We do not live lives that come from nowhere or apparently neutral. We live lives that are rooted in different experiences of access, freedom and autonomy, privilege or subordination, recognition, and again, support and legitimacy of our very selves. So when we evaluate a range of social, political, economic, and cultural issues through a gendered lens, we are not counting sex bodies because sadly a number of people imagine that we're counting how many women, how many men, and in only limited spaces, how many gender non-conforming people. 
what we are doing is we are accounting for those material, political, social, mm -hmm. cultural conditions that affect how people can live their lives, how they enjoy access to citizenship, access to rights, access to freedom. So we consider how the structures and social relations within our society mediate, eliminate, impinge upon, or even benefit our social lives and our living and the relationships that we have. So if we are examining climate change and food justice, we will look through a gendered lens because we know, for example, that gender has a significant implication around life and livelihood, similarly around health. If we're evaluating, say, in something like sexual and reproductive health and rights, we examine it in terms of how bodies become vulnerable. How have they been vulnerable and how do they continue to be vulnerable based on our ideas around femininity and masculinities in the plural and sexualities attached to these. So that nuance and complexity comes in when we accept that people live certain uh, a range of effects in a social space. And if I may add to that, PK, uh, I think that gender is a relatively new concept, although it's been in active use, let's say, for the last 40 years or so, because prior to that, there was not an understanding of the difference and the differential impact that men and that, that yeah. affect factors like the economy, like health also affected women and men. And therefore entering that variable has opened up a whole new set of information that was not available before. And it's actually very exciting information. And, in the, and women did this to try to understand themselves or ourselves and why we were in the situations we are. But in doing so, we also understood much more about men and about masculinities and the ways in which structures of gender and identity affect masculine behavior and shape the ways in which women and men relate. So it's actually a very interesting field. It's one that students find very empowering because it helps them to understand so much of life that's going on. But it's also a broad and complex field. You know, people are researching so many different aspects. And myself as a scholar, I find it sometimes so difficult to limit myself in the areas that I engage because it really brings a whole set of new knowledge that we did not have before. And you talk about trying to limit yourself, and I want to give you, I want to cut track for Guti to run Professor Redock, because I also want to add the, the variability or the positionality of the being in the Caribbean space. So in terms oh, of yeah. looking at some of the things that you've done in terms of sex, power, and taboo, gender and HIV in the Caribbean and beyond, the colonial perspectives on entangled inequalities, Europe and the Caribbean, and them studies in decoloniality and migration, uh, interrogating Caribbean masculinities, theoretical and empirical analyses, Caribbean sociology, just to name a few. How does operating through the lens, or a gendered lens, as Dr. Barrett would have said, but doing it within the parameters of being in the Caribbean space, be it physically or diaspora, does that put a new wrinkle on it? No, that, you know, that's actually very important because, uh, of course, gendered behaviors, gender ideologies, all of these things are shaped by your history and the history of coastal shaped culture, for example, colonialism, enslavement, indentureship, uh, being next door to Venezuela, all kinds of factors shape the ways in which women and men experience their lives in society. But what is important and what I've been trying to show in my work is that even though the Caribbean might be a small dot of islands, the scholarship that we do here is relevant not only for us, but for people in other parts of the world. You know, the same way we study research carried out elsewhere, and the concepts and yeah. theories that emerge out of that. We, we also think, and I also think, that our work is also relevant globally. And I think that that is how we have to empower our students to think that we don't only absorb knowledge, we also create knowledge 
which is useful to the world. And if I was a uh, current or prospective student, no, remember that pointer, because we already have a big half and a small half. So we get into the smaller half when we return. We're speaking with Dr. Suan Barrett, as well as Professor Rhoda Redox. Stay with us. We return after this. Welcome back. We are speaking with uh, Professor Rhoda Redock as well as Dr. Suan Barrett. And we're doing so ahead of a virtual presentation titled Do Women Still Need Rights? We haven't spoken about the presentation as yet, and I'm very happy for us to go all over the place towards that uh, destination. But Dr. Barrett, I didn't want to minge on the response that you were going to give, so you could explicate yourself now. Of course, <laughs> I wanted to just um, add on to what Prof was saying in the sense of, yes, we produce knowledge. And I think what's so powerful is that we produce knowledge that accounts for these intersecting ways that we live and how that complicates our understanding of what it is to be masculine or feminine or somewhere in between or beyond. Because within the Caribbean, we have an interesting juxtaposition of tradition and newness. We have the you know, imports from outside of ourselves, both in the global south and global north, as well as our own assertions of ourselves. As you know, we say we balance ourselves in unique ways. And every time we try to understand how we engage in notions of identity, sexuality, race, whatever it may be, we then have to always account for the complexity of each acting person and what they enact that it may not mirror how we understand this context or this relationship or this experience because each person brings this host, this wealth of influencing factors that have long featured the Caribbean region for the reasons that Prof has already outlined. And I think that in particular makes it hard to access sometimes in quantifiable chunks, but makes it very revealing when we give space to describe and account for these experiences in their full in their fullness, you know, completely. But Dr. Barra, do you think it's bigger than you sometimes? And do you almost feel a sense of responsibility take to continue the work, taking it forward, work done by the likes of Prof and others in masculinity studies, etc.? Well, it's a huge undertaking, but I can say sitting here with Prof, um, she and all those who came before us taught us how to walk were good walk steady and walk consistently. It's a lifelong commitment. We wouldn't achieve everything we want to achieve in our lifetime, but we have dedicated our lives, our scholarship, our advocacy, our activism, and however we express it to build, take power, gender justice. And I think that from the origins of the Institute and for us, for example, I was a student here and then moving on into professionalism, we understand that yes, it is bigger than us. It will always be bigger than us, but we have to continue to work consistently and stubbornly, doggedly, um, to achieve our goals. So we walk in good with the strengths that we got from those who came before us. Mm -hmm. And Prof, even before we start to talk about the main point of the presentation, I want to ask you your take on how important is it that academia helps to influence these discussions, especially when... Everybody can create content now. Everybody has a phone who influencing, who have this. And it seems as though that access to having people see and get your views has increased. How important is it that academia is able to influence some of these discussions? Well, you know, Dr. Barrett is a communication scholar. So I think that she can really take this issue on. But it is true that uh, for those of us in academia, well, the IGDS has always been a little more transgressive in that we have always uh, sought other approaches come from community work and community activism, film, video. I mean, we have always been very creative in the way that we have used various media that are available. So I think that's a tradition that I'm sure will continue and go in new directions. Yeah. But I do think the whole question of knowledge creation 
and content creation is going to be a big challenge. And I think that as feminist scholars, we have to do our own research and develop strategies to address this. Because as Dr. Barrett mentioned in a recent interview, we're in a difficult period in the world at the present time. It's a period of pushback. I like to, I use stronger terms. I think it's a period of creeping or galloping authoritarianism. Uh, we see the rollback of many of the gains that were made not only for women, but for human beings and people generally. And there's a there's there's a there's a loss of the political intent to move towards justice of all kinds, including gender justice, including social and economic justice. So it's a time when those of us in gender studies have a lot more work to do. We have a lot more education and outreach and discussions to do in order to bring this kind of understand, this kind of consciousness and awareness and commitment to a wider population. And I think especially uh, young people who are the ones who are, into, although not the only ones, who are very much interfacing with these new media and new communication forms. Okay, and thank you so much for that. And we have about two and a half minutes, ladies. So with that, we're giving, uh, we're trying to split that time. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Barrett will ask you for registration details. Uh, we know it's on Wednesday, but how does someone engage with the, with the presentation? And then we ask for a little, I don't know if it's the rationale or the abstract of, the, of, of Prof's presentation. So we try to get those two things with, starting with you, please, Dr. Barrett. Of course. So I would invite, uh, we were talking about new media, I would invite any person who is interested to join, visit our Instagram, our Facebook, all of our platforms, the IGDS, and you will see the regis registration link there under our promotion material, Do Women Still Need Rights? Uh, uh, just see the URL, click on it, you will be registered and you will get the link to the event. Um, of course, uh, you will, we will share it here with you, but you click that link and you join us uh, on Wednesday for Prof's very enlightening and very, very much contemplative question in 2024. Do women still need rights? I'm not going to call out the URL uh, because it's long, but please visit our website, our Facebook, our Instagram. Thank you so much for that. Now, yes, Prof. When I, when I chose that title, I didn't know that it would actually be part of a recent political statement here in Trinidad and Tobago. But I think it is a question that many people ask. And in fact, on International Women's Day in Woodford Square, a younger woman felt that we were making too much fuss. You know, that, that this is an issue that women in Trinidad and Tobago really have it together. And that, you know, we shouldn't really continue on this footing. So what I want to raise is the UN CEDAW Convention, which is basically the Women's Human Rights Charter. And we feel that it needs more recognition. More people need to know about it. More people need to know of the rights that do exist and the mechanisms that may be available to ensure that we continue to have some of the rights that we enjoy. And therefore, I see this as an opportunity to share information, to engage, to have discussion, because I know there will probably be questions after, about also how Caribbean women have contributed to the UN Women's Human Rights Framework internationally. Thank you so much, ladies. I, can, I, I think I'm having a dear diary moment having this conversation with you. But looking at the work that is being done and thank you for it and looking at other things and how we can be a part of it. But we want to thank you very much, Professor Rhoda Redock, as well as Dr. Sue Ann Barrett and everyone who would have tuned into this conversation. We thank you so much. This has been In Depth with me, DK Roster. On behalf of the entire news team, thank you so much for joining us.